Today's exciting episode deals with Pascal's principle and different types of pressure gauges, including what's called a barometer. So first off, Pascal's principle. This is pretty cool. Pascal's a smart guy. You know, he made his triangle and all that stuff and did some physics too. So it basically says if you have a pressure applied to a confined fluid, so we're not talking about uh, pushing down on like an open bucket of water, it's got to be confined, uh, then the pressure at every point within the fluid increases by that same amount. And the application that we are going to look at most is this one here, what's called a hydraulic lift. This is also how brakes work. But the idea is <clears throat> if you push on the fluid over here, that causes the pressure to increase here. And that pressure essentially propagates throughout the fluid until the pressure is equal everywhere. And so the pressure will have increased everywhere by the amount that you increased it over here on this end. If the pressure weren't equal everywhere, then the fluid would keep flowing to even out the pressure until it was equal. So that's kind of the basic definition is it has to be equal, otherwise it'll keep moving until it is equal. And uh, so if we're looking at the static case where it's no longer moving, it has to be equal. And what this allows us to do, if we know just uh, that the pressure is equal at any point, we know that the pressure on this piston here has to equal the pressure on this piston here. And we like to label those pressure in and pressure out because this is the input piston that we're controlling and this is kind of the output that we get by controlling this piston over here. So. If we start with that basic idea that the pressure on the input side equals the pressure on the output side, and then we apply the equation, I'm going to jump up here, uh, force over area, which is our basic definition of pressure, then we can say the force on the input side over the area on the input side. Yeah, that's an ugly equal sign. equals the force on the output side over the area on the output side. And this is one of our new equations that we're going to use a bit. But essentially what's going on here is if you have a small area of your input side and a large area of your output side, if this is small and that's big, in order to keep this ratio constant, the force has to be smaller by the same factor that the area is smaller, <clears throat> or this force is bigger by the same factor this area is bigger. So let's say that the <clears throat> area of this large piston here is five times the area of this small piston. Essentially this is what we would call a force multiplier, kind of like levers and things if you've studied some simple machines. So whatever force I exert here, if it were five newtons, and if this area is five times the area, then that gets multiplied by that same factor. So we'd have 25 newtons coming out over here. And usually in hydraulic systems, the, the difference in the areas is even more extreme than that. So you can get your, your force multiplied by thousands of, of times. Now, we're not violating any laws of energy or anything here. If you think about this in terms of the work done, you have a certain force. And when you exert that force, this piston has to move quite a bit farther than what this piston will. So you have a smaller force over a longer distance. Here you get a big force over a short distance, but you're still doing the same total work. You're not violating conservation of energy. You're getting any, getting any work out for free. Uh, you're just changing the amount of force and by changing the amount of distance, effectively doing that by having the different areas there. All right, uh, on to some different ways of measuring pressure. <clears throat> Here's one way you could do it. If you have a tube filled with some kind of liquid and you leave one end open and then you blow on the other end, well, that liquid is going to rise by a certain amount. And you could calculate the pressure over here on this end <clears throat> by looking at how high the level of fluid is over here compared to here. In the last video, we talked about <clears throat> delta P. That's an ugly delta. Uh, is equal to rho g delta h. So as long as we measure the difference in the fluid levels and if we know the density of the fluid we're using, that's a simple way that you can measure the pressure here. Now we have atmospheric pressure here, but 
This uh, would also be the pressure applied plus atmospheric pressure. But we don't really care about the fact there's atmospheric pressure here. These guys are essentially canceling each other out. What we care about is this additional pressure here, and that's what we call gauge pressure. So that's what this delta P here would give us. That would give us the gauge pressure. Um, probably a pressure device you've seen more often is um, the one that you keep in your glove box to measure tire pressure. So the, uh, the tire valve thing goes here. And these ones are just spring-loaded. They don't use fluids, actually. But that uh, air exerts a pressure here, and the spring is calibrated so that uh, it will compress by the right amount for the given pressure. And then you've got a stick thing that sticks out, and you can read the pressure. We're not going to really do anything with these, but just so you know, that that's how they work. All right, probably the first way that we measured pressure kind of similar to, to this idea here, but a little bit different, is what's called a barometer. We still use these today to measure atmospheric pressure. And it was Torcelli, a good Italian physicist, who first figured out how to make this type of barometer. And what you do is <clears throat> you take a cylinder and you fill it completely with a fluid all the way to the top. So this one's kind of upside down, but let's say Let's say you've got a test tube or something. And so you're going to fill it all the way to the top. And then if you cover the top, say you put some paraffin film or something over there, so that, stop going away, circle. All right. <laughs> OK, it doesn't want to stay there. One more time. Stay, maybe. Anyway, cover the top and uh, turn it upside down while the top is still covered and put it in an open container of the same fluid and then if you remove the covering here, what's going to happen is this fluid is going to go down a little bit. But since it was completely full, there's no pressure here. So it's, it's kind of like it creates a vacuum. Because on the outside here, you have air pressure pushing down. And so that air pressure creates an atmosphere of pressure all throughout this fluid, which creates a pressure essentially pushing up because pressure can change direction like that. So you have pressure pushing up, holding up the weight of this fluid. Now if the atmospheric pressure changes, if it goes down a little bit, then you don't have as big of a force holding this up, and so this will drop down a little bit. And once you calibrate that, uh, pressure can increase also, and that would cause the level to go up some. So you can use this to measure atmospheric pressure. Um, it's kind of a similar idea to this idea of the atmosphere pushing down on things is similar to uh, if you've ever put your straw in a glass of water and then covered your f the end with your finger. Let's see if it's going to erase my circles again. So here's your straw and uh, say the water was like here and you put your finger over it and then you take it out of the water, that water doesn't fall out. It's kind of the same idea that you have atmospheric pressure pushing up. And, and it, when you first take it out, this is, level is going to drop a tiny bit. And when that happens, even though there was already some air, it was at atmospheric pressure to begin with. But when that drops, the, <clears throat> the air is taking up a larger volume and uh, the number of particles is constant. So from PV equals nRT, if the pressure, uh, if the volume increases, the pressure has to decrease. So you have lower pressure there than there, and that's what's holding that water in the straw. All right. Uh, and this was originally done with uh, this one here being shown as mercury. That's why it's saying 76 centimeters. That's the uh, maximum height that one atmosphere of pressure can support because once you have 76 centimeters of mercury then um, the weight of the mercury is going to equal uh, the pressure divided by or the pressure times the area of your tube and this is why we have this measurement millimeters of mercury as a measure of pressure because originally people didn't convert it to atmospheres they're just like oh our tube is at 76 millimeters of mercury today and then the next day when pressure went down like oh it's only at 74 millimeters of mercury or whatever oh not 74 740 uh, one atmosphere by the way is equal to 760 millimeters 
of mercury or 76 centimeters so I said that wrong with my little example but you get the idea and you can do this with other fluids as well um, and I'll go through the calculations of why mercury is good uh, mercury is dense and that allows you to have a fairly short column if you have a fluid that is less dense like water then you might need a gigantic column like this um, where you could still do it but it's going to be a little inconvenient to read the column all the way up there um, and you have to start with it completely full uh, in order to get this to work right otherwise if, if you're just doing like the straw thing um, the, you, you're not going to be measuring the, the absolute pressure because you're going to have some pressure in here that you don't know and then you're going to have the pressure out here so that's why if we start with it completely full when this drops down there was no gas in there to begin with so this cavity here is going to be at zero pressure so yeah, it's hard to see on this one but this is also a closed tube on the top it's not open up to the air the the part that's exposed to the air is the bucket down here so there's air pressure pushing down on the bucket here affecting how much fluid is going up and down in that column that's all for today